Welcome to this talk on Datadog's use of TLA plus and simulations. I'm Arun, I'm an engineer at Datadog. I've worked at Datadog for three years. I'm in the task platform team where we build queues, schedulers, and execution runtimes. Uh, before Datadog, I worked at Samsung where I built an actor model based uh, system for track of, as for that IoT device is connected to. Uh, Sash Nala was supposed to be a co-host or a co-presenter for this talk today, but he couldn't make it due to other work commitments. He built the TLA plus model and simulations that we'll be looking at in this talk. So most of this discussion today will be centered around a queuing system at Datadog called Delancey. So Delancey is essentially our asynchronous job running framework. It's one of the frameworks that Datadog built and uses. And Delancey has been used at Datadog for over 10 years. Uh, Delancey uses a Redis-based solution for queuing. However, as the company grew and as the system grew, it was becoming inadequate for new use cases. First uh, is that since being backed by Redis, it's a single node system, and its throughput was limited to that of what a single node can do. So I, f I spent a lot of time originally trying to optimize single node performance, you know, trying different instance types, benchmarking different re Redis configurations, that sort of stuff. But even so, you know, there's an upper limit to what we can accomplish with a single node, so naturally this system had to be sharded. And sharding in this system was being managed manually, meaning that any time a shard got too big, I would have to split it up, and any time necessary, I would have to merge it back together. So what that looks like in practice is that when a shard's throughput exceeds some threshold, it would page me, and then I would have to go look at a few dashboards, figure out which queues in a shard grew too big, either move them to an existing shard that's, that has to lower throughput or spin up a new shard entirely. This was a very tedious process and can t easily take an entire day to do. Next is that multi-tenancy in the system was not handled in an efficient way. So multi-tenancy was basic, basically meant we spin up a new shard and move host only one tenant on it. And if that tenant's throughput is really low, then that shard remains un underutilized. And moreover, I started uncovering new use cases where durability of data was a concern and use cases that needed an order of magnitude more queues than what this system could support. So over time, what was once a simple single node system became a complex distributed system with significant management overhead and was not meeting the needs of new use cases. And here's when my team and I decided to look at ways to evolve the system. Uh, specifically, we were interested in the queuing part of the system, and we considered a few, uh, you know, a few queues, ones that are provided by cloud providers, for example. But each cloud provider has uh, their own solo queuing solution, each with a different API, and, and each system behaved in subtly different ways. And this was difficult to use at Datadog because we deployed to multiple cloud providers. Uh, we considered more options, but one, so one system that caught our attention is a system at Apple called Quick, and it had a lot of the properties that I was looking for, such as the ability to have many queues, linear scalability, and fairness. Moreover, Quick was almost identical to Delancey. Uh, for example, Delancey had two layers of queuing, so did Quick. The way message leases and queue leases worked were also identical. But Quick had one key difference. It was backed by Foundation DB and was able to offer stronger guarantees of durability and horizontal scalability. And so my team and I, we had some discussions and we decided to build a second iteration of the system using Foundation DB at the storage layer and, ex and exposed a few simple APIs for sending, receiving, and deleting messages. Uh, we called this new system Courier. And in Courier, to solve for multi-tenancy, what we did was we, we had it backed by multiple Foundation DB clusters. Initially, our plan was to have eight clusters, and each tenant in the system would be sharded into four of these clusters, such that no two tenants shared the same four clusters. Um, the brokers also exposed, and then I had another broker layer that exposed gRPC APIs that clients connected to, and all the sharding logic lived in the brokers. Um, the brokers also performed health checks on Foundation DB and would exclude them anytime it found a cluster to be unhealthy. So by now, uh, my team and I had a design document written for Courier. Uh, however, there still wasn't a way we could, we could say for sure that this system met a couple of properties. The first one is that I wanted to ensure Courier never lost a message. And what I mean by that is once a message is sent to Courier, it's eventually received by a client and then deleted, or after a configured number of delivery attempts, it would be moved to a dead letter queue. And the second property I wanted to verify is that at any given time, there's at most one lease per message. And a lease is basically a contract between the brokers and the receivers where the broker guarantees that it will not deliver that message to another worker for a specific uh, period of time. 
Um, you know, my team and I, we did our best. We used our collective experience and we reasoned through all the failure modes that we could think of. But given the complexity of the system, there's definitely a chance that we didn't think of everything. And second, I wanted to use the system for notification delivery and executing workflow actions, which are all critical workloads for Datadog. And so I had to be sure in what the system can do. And this was our motivation to model the system using TLA+. Uh, in TLA+, plus, this we model career as, as uh, a set of three processes. I'm first gonna talk through like the state machine for each process and then I'll show a sequence diagram on how these processes interact with each other. So here we have the senders that send a message to the, uh, to the broker, they wait for a response and then they send another message and then wait for a response. They keep repeating this until a pre-configured number of messages has been sent and then they terminate. Then there's, there are brokers which perform health checks on the various foundation DB clusters. Then we have receivers that send a receive message request to the broker, wait for a response, and then delete that message, wait for a response, and then we'll terminate once all the queues have been drained. And for Foundation DB, we used a variable to represent it just to keep the number of states in the system low. We, and we couldn't really think of a reason to use a process for it. And then we had another variable that tracked statistics in this model, and some of our properties were defined using this variable. And lastly are some, uh, some variables to enable communication between the processes. And so here's what an interaction looks like. Here's the sequence diagram. So here a sender is sending a message to the broker. The broker will write that to Foundation DB and return a response. Then we have a receiver that sends a, that sends a receive request to the broker, which then fetches a, fetches a message from Foundation DB and returns it to the client. Then we have a delete message request, uh, which the broker will delete the message from Foundation DB if a lease is active for it, otherwise it returns an error. And lastly, uh, the brokers perform health checks on Foundation DB. So this is one sequence of operations that can happen in the system, but there could be several other. For example, you can imagine a case where the health checks happen first, and then everything, everything else shown here happens. Or a case where a receive message is called first, and then a health check happens, and then the send message happens, and so on. Uh, and what TL, TLA Plus does is it takes every single, every possible state that the system can exist in, and verifies that in no state are our properties violated. And so we ran this model through the TLC model checker, and this is the output we got. Uh, here's what like a successful output looked like. In this case, it scanned over five million distinct states and found no scenarios where our properties were violated. Um, this was obviously a good result, and this is significantly higher than what me and my team could have reasoned through collectively. Um, but in addition to this, I found it valuable in a couple of other ways. First is that it provided me and my team a shared understanding of the system, and also a common language through which we could communicate properties about the system. Second is that when I started implementing the system, it forced me to be more precise, as I was always trying to think, uh, keep the implementation consistent with what was modeled. And so here are some of the conversations I was having my, with my team uh, while I was implementing Career. Uh, here's one where I was able to eliminate the use of snapshot reads in the way we picked messages for delivery. And this was actually a big simplification for us since every transaction now became strictly serializable and it was very easy to reason about. The, and then here's another one uh, where when I was reading through how the model implemented health checks and compared to what I was doing in the code, I found a small concurrency bug that would sometimes leave a connection, uh, an unhealthy connection in the connection pool. So, so far I've been talking about Courier, but Courier is not the first system that used formal modeling at Datadog. We actually used PlusCal to verify item potency properties in Husky, which is Datadog's wide column storage. Um, Another thing to note is that Husky was modeled after it was already in production, and the PlusCal syntax actually made it very easy to keep the model consistent with the implementation. Uh, for Career 2, we started with PlusCal, but it became cumbersome too quickly. It had too many states, and the model checking started becoming very slow. And so we rewrote the Career, Career's, TLA plus, sorry, Career's PlusCal model into TLA+, plus, which gave us more control over state transitions and helped uh, reduce the number of states in the system, which then made model checking a little faster. Another area we used formal modeling was I used PlusCal to model a replication bug used in uh, used by Chrono Datadog's cron scheduler. I, in this, I, I didn't model the whole system. I just modeled enough to show the existence of the bug and also the effectiveness of the fix. 
So going back to career, by now I was confident in the system's correctness and uh, safe, liveness and safety properties, but I didn't really, it wasn't really adequate to explain how the system actually performs, right? Like it didn't tell me, you know, what latencies I can expect, um, how the system performs in overload and under outages. So this blog post by Mark Brooker actually resonated with our experience. Uh, formal methods did indeed solve only half our problem. One scenario that was at the front of my mind during this time is an incident that Datadoc suffered in March 2023. Essentially, there was an automatic security update that triggered an error condition in our networking stack and it rendered a large part of our compute fleet offline. Um, this was actually a pretty big incident. It took almost two days to fully restore. Um, and there's a series of posts in our engineering blog that detail what happened and what we did to fix it that, uh, that's linked in, this, in the slides. Um, yeah, there were many lessons learned, but to me, one, one thing that stood out was the failure modes of, of, of quorum-based distributed systems. In these systems, as soon as we lose the majority of the nodes, the system's hard down. They won't even be able to serve a single request, even if there are several healthy nodes available. And we see this behavior on recovery too. The system needs at least a quorum of, no quorum of nodes available before it can serve a single request. And in the context of courier, Foundation DB is a quorum-based system and is susceptible to this exact same failure mode. But what I really want is a system that can degrade gracefully, one where throughput is proportional to the number of compute nodes available. So if I have a single compute node, I should be able to serve at least some requests. And so for Courier, I mentioned earlier that I was going to use multiple foundation DB clusters for multi-tenancy. Another reason I did that is also to protect against a failure mode like this. So imagine a scenario where I just have 100, let's say I just had a single foundation DB cluster, it has 100 nodes. In that scenario, if I lost 51% of the nodes, then the system is dead. Uh, but now if I take the same 100 nodes and I have 10 foundation DB clusters each with 10 nodes, and I lost 51 nodes, there's a chance that you know four or five clusters survive depending on where the node loss happened. Um, this was my intuition, but I didn't have a way to quantify this. So this is when uh, we began looking at simulations. One of the things we did early on in Courier when we were considering FIFO properties is we ran our TLA plus model in simulation mode and tried to measure the number of states that violated FIFO. And what we saw is that whenever there was um, a foundation DB health check failure or message read deliveries, the number of FIFO violations would, would spike up. Uh, this was actually inspired by Jack Van Lightly and Marcus's talk uh, in this conference a couple of years ago. Um, this was good, but we didn't know how to use this for the scenario that we just described earlier. So here's where another blog post from Mark actually seemed more appropriate. And inspired by this blog post, what we did was we used official um, benchmarking numbers from Foundation DB. This told us approximately how much CPU time each request in the system would take. And then from our, uh, from my design document, I know how many Foundation DB operations are involved in each kind of uh, request. So for receive messages, for example, it takes four transactions with two reads and five writes. Using both of this information, we created a discrete event simulation using a library in Python called SimPy that had simulated senders, receivers, and brokers, and it measured throughput against node loss. Another thing to note is that since we had the TLA plus model already, it was easy for us to think of the system in terms of discrete events. Because, like we saw the state machine diagram earlier, right? It was mostly a translation of that. Uh, so yeah, uh, there were two scenarios that I was interested in. One is where node loss happens in a way that's distributed across availability zones. This leaves more clusters healthy for longer periods of time. Uh, and so we call this like the optimistic scenario. And then another scenario where node loss happens in a way that's concentrated within availability zones and entire availability zones go offline at once. Uh, this is the pessimistic scenario because the system loses availability much quicker. Uh, running, and this is a chart uh, that shows the result of the simulation. The y-axis is the number of successful requests, x-axis is the failed node percentage, and the blue line shows the optimistic scenario, and the red line shows the pessimistic scenario. Now I'm gonna draw a line on this chart that shows how, the, how a best case system would behave. So the green line here shows what an ideal system that exhibits perfect uh, linear, linear degradation would, would do. And we see that like the optimistic scenario is actually pretty close to what the best case behavior is. And then another, I'm gonna draw another line, the black line here shows what a single cluster system would behave like. 
And we can see that even in the pessimistic scenario, this system has higher availability compared to what a single cluster can do. This was obviously a good finding, but I was still skeptical because I didn't understand these oscillations in throughput. And so at first I thought, you know, maybe the simulation is inaccurate and I wouldn't see this um, in the real system. But digging through the data from the simulations, this CPU usage information sort of seemed to explain what was happening. So whenever a foundation DB cluster loses nodes, its CPU usage starts to go up. When that happens, the cluster's throughput starts to fall. And then when the cluster is completely dead, Courier will detect that health check failure and redistribute traffic to healthy foundation DB clusters. And when this happens, the throughput of the system recovers, and this process keeps repeating for every cluster in the system. And so that's why we see the oscillations in throughput. So to test this theory, what we did next was we just changed the weights of the foundation DB transaction in the simulation to be like very in inexpensive to execute, and then we ran the simulation again. And this time, the, the oscillations in throughput were greatly diminished. So this was obviously, uh, this was exactly the sort of information we were looking for. But what was more validating is that once I built the system, I actually deployed it to an environment, and I started mimicking the pessimistic scenario, where I started killing fo foundation DB nodes. Um, and what I saw was, was that it was actually pretty close to what was simulated. The throughput of the system drops sharply after 60% node loss. Um, one thing to note is that I used a slightly different configuration here. Um, in, this sim in this experiment, I used four foundation DB clusters with nine nodes. In the simulations, I had eight foundation DB clusters with three nodes. Um, I mean, the reason for that is just, is just because it worked better with our internal tooling, and I didn't want to mess with that. And I was also confident in the results of the simulation, so I didn't find a need to try a different configuration. Anyhow, to summarize, to me, the value of simulation was that it enabled me to recreate a complex failure mode and get a range of impact analysis even before I had implemented the system, and this was like very inexpensive to do. And second is that once I implemented the system, it made chaos testing it easier because now I knew exactly the scenarios I wanted to test for and also what to expect approximately from them. Uh, so after this was done, we you know, implemented the system and started doing some performance tests against it. Unfortunately, however, I couldn't get enough, I couldn't get the performance numbers needed for the system to be cost effective. Uh, one of the issues was getting enough throughput from Foundation DB. The sequential nature of my workload actually made it difficult for Foundation DB to partition data correctly. And it would end up, end up creating hotspots in Foundation DB, which then reduces the throughput. Likewise, having multiple consumers compete for a message at the head of the queue didn't work well with Foundation DB's transaction conflict resolution mechanism. And that also further reduced throughput in the system. So to work around these issues, I introduced another process in the system called a sequencer. And what the sequencer does is it periodically runs scans for undelivered messages in Foundation DB and pushes them to Redis. Then when the broker gets a receive message, or message request call, it now goes to, uh, to Redis to get a message rather than Foundation DB. So what this does is like it moves all the competing consumers to Redis rather than Foundation DB. And Foundation DB is now more or less a KV store. So here's you know, the, uh, the updated sequence diagram with Redis in it. Send messages still work the same. Then, uh, as I mentioned, there is a sequencer which reads messages from Foundation DB and pushes them to Redis. Then uh, fetch messages or receive message request now fetches a message from Redis rather than Foundation DB. And delete messages now deletes a message from Foundation DB rather than uh, Foundation DB as well as from Redis if Elise is active. And health checks still work the same. So we updated our TLA plus model with Redis in it. We again used a variable to re represent Redis. And now when I ran it, it, it failed. This was a surprising result to me. Specifically, the property that checks that all messages are eventually deleted or moved to dead letter queue failed. Honestly, I was expecting this to pass. When I looked at the trace from this failure, what it showed me was after a send message request, a client would, or a receiver would try to receive a message multiple times and not get anything back. Um, and the reason, and in this particular model, uh, the receivers are only configured to attempt three times before they terminate. So the issue here is that the sequencer is not guaranteed to run within three attempts of the receiver. And in, fa and in theory, they're not guaranteed to run within any number of attempts of the receiver. But in practice, however, 
receivers retry indefinitely, and the sequencer will run periodically. Even if it were down or you know unavailable, eventually some engineer would get paged, bring the system back up, and it'll start running. So perhaps our property should now check that a, a message is persisted in FDB or delivered or moved to dead letter queue. Anyhow, what this is pointing me is, is to two facts. One is that a message is no longer receivable immediately after it's sent, and two is that there is an availability risk, like we discussed. If the sequencer is down or unavailable, then messages cannot be received. Both these were issues I knew about when I was introducing the sequencer to the design, but what the TLA plus model gave me was an assurance that I didn't introduce any other failure mode while I made this change. So to summarize, uh, we found it particularly valuable to combine modeling and simulations. Modeling helped us verify the correctness of the system, whereas simulations enabled us to estimate how the system behaves under overload and outages. Both of these combined actually made our development process faster. We were able to get the system to production within 11 months. But now that the system is in production, I find it difficult to keep the model up to date with, uh, with the implementation. I might update the model if I'm making a large design change, but for day-to-day -day bug fixes, small changes, I tend to not update the model. And, but you know, we did spend so much effort up front making sure the implementation of the system was rigorous and, uh, and precise, and we don't want the system to regress uh, as, we, as, it, as it's in production. So one technology I think that could help are deterministic simulators. Uh, deterministic simulators are essentially execution runtimes where your application is executed in a perfectly deterministic way. Uh, clocks are deterministic, so, uh, you know, thread scheduling, process scheduling is all deterministic, uh, random number generators are deterministic, et cetera. These uh, systems can also simulate time and run your application much faster than it can in the real world. And sometimes faults are also injected into deterministic simulators so that, and, 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 and measure how your system behaves. So the idea here is like we can, if we had a battery of tests that ran in a deterministic simulator and we used like a different seed value or something, uh, we would cover a large number of states every time we made a change. Like we could run this in CI is the, is the, is the idea. So we met with Antithesis in 2022 who, who, who are a company that builds a powerful deterministic uh, simulation platform. Um, their platform was very uh, impressive to us. However, at that time, we were just too early. We only had, we didn't even have a design uh, flushed out for career. And we were also thinking of implementing something more low level. For example, we want to be able to verify that once a delete request executes, all data related to that message is deleted from Foundation DB, that, that we didn't leave any dangling data. And perhaps something that could be hosted on Datadog's infrastructure just because it makes it easier to incorporate into our development process. Um, here's a tweet from Joran Grief from Tiger Beetle who explains the value of having both kinds of simulations. One like antithesis that can test a compiled binary from the outside. And then one that's internal to Tiger Beetle that can t test things like you know, checking page cache coherency. However, for us, uh, Courier was written in Go. And Go just introduces a lot of non-determinism. Um, for example, Go routine scheduling is non-deterministic. Map iteration is not deterministic. The way select statements execute are non-deterministic. And this just made it very hard for us to actually build, build like a deterministic system on top of. Um, we did present all these insights to Go language contributors around testing distributed systems. And it turns out that they also face similar issues with testing Go scheduler itself. Then we tried using Hermit, which is an emulation layer on top of the Linux kernel built by Meta, and they, this is also a deterministic platform. And they use it to run CI tests, and we were able to get that working for simple Go applications, but anything that required CGO, we, we couldn't get, that, get it working for that. So now what we're thinking is perhaps there's a way to make Golang itself deterministic, like having an experimental compile flag, for example, that can produce or run your Go application in a deterministic way. Um, yeah, that remains an area of exploration for us, and we'll share if we make any progress. Um, that's all I had for today's presentation. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to email me or Sesh, or yeah, or I can answer some right now. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah, thanks. Round of applause. Yeah. Um, it looks like we had one question chomping at the bit over here. So, how did you come across TLA Plus, and how was your learning experience? <laughs> and is the models available? Uh, so our plan is to eventually open source or like we'll share the model in some way. Um, 
So how I came across TLA Plus was Sesh, who was supposed to be my co-presenter, he, he has a lot of formal modeling experience. He's like used this technology in like brokerage trading firms and like in civil aviation systems. So he was the one who actually brought TLA Plus into Datadog and he used it to model Husky and he did it mostly as a learning exercise. And after that, inspired by his work obviously, I tried to model this production bug fix that I mentioned in the talk. And it was, I only modeled enough of the system, right? So that way, like, I didn't have to, it wasn't very intimidating for me since I was just writing a small model. And, and yeah, so that was really my learning process. Like, I just, honestly, I just read, like, Hillel Wayne's uh, book on TLA+, Plus, and that got me what I, what, where I had to go. Sounds like we need a survey that includes that question. <laughs> <laughs> any, any other questions? Okay. Related to his question, uh, did you consider any other formal methods tools? Uh, and what are your criteria in choosing each one? I mean, so I think we did look at state right briefly, uh, which is another model checker written in Rust. Uh, and there are some systems at Datadog that do use uh, state right. But for me, I personally found it easier to learn TLA plus just because I'm not familiar with Rust already. And with TLA plus, I was actually learning how to model directly. Whereas if I use state right, I would have to like learn Rust first and then figure out how I model the system. So that was like one criteria. Okay, we have one more question. I'm just wondering about your determinizing the Go runtime comments at the end there. I was, are you looking for like an implementation level model checker? Um, not a model checker necessarily. It's just that some way to execute the application in a deterministic way. For example, like we might be able to provide a seed value when you're when you're compiling the binary, and that that binary will always execute in a particular way. Are you doing that to explore the state space of the program or for something? Uh, else? Eventually, yeah. Yep. I also am very interested in the Go side of things, so um, mm -hmm. we have to move on to the next uh, speaker. But thank you so much. Um, another round of applause.